Hi, everybody. My name is Shai. I'm uh, from Blue Sea, and we're the Google Plus of the sea. So, sorry, uh, is there a pointer for us? Thank you. Yeah. And today we have covered a number of issues related to workspace development. We have workspace on social network, workspace in um, innovative real estate planning. So what's special about Blue Seed? Blue Seed is the first workspace in the ocean that gathers the best talents worldwide. And here it is. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, here it is, but uh, let's leave it there just for now. Um, before we get into that, there's an interesting question that we want to ask for planning this thing. That is, why do we want to put a workspace on the ocean? The reason is that uh, there simply are no US visas for entrepreneurs. We all know that Silicon Valley is the best place in the world to start a company, but let's say that you're from outside the US and you want to come here to start a company. You can't work on the business or tourist visa the EB-5 remains ridiculously expensive, and we all know how hard it is to get the H-1B. Therefore, here's the situation we're facing. Visa restrictions make it hard for everybody to come as an entrepreneur, and Silicon Valley is in the box. So what can we do? Let's think outside the box and look to the left. And here's the solution. We'll put a ship anchored 12 miles offshore in international waters and outside of US jurisdiction. And this will be a ship of a thousand of the world's boldest and brightest entrepreneurs in the high-tech startup community. So there are several interesting questions that we want to ask when planning and designing this startup community. The first is a big reality check question. That is, how much workspace do we actually need to make it? Certainly that um, an office as comfortable and nice will be, as this will be nice, but um, Look at this. I believe this is our, some people, how some people in Japan work. And the second question is, how much comfortable workspace can the ship provide? Certainly it will be, after all, the space on the ship is limited, so we want to make sure that everybody actually have an awesome experience, not uh, something like this. <laughs> so in order to do this analysis, let's start from ourselves. So this is our office. Our office hosted like comfortably four workspaces in 150 square foot. That's one of the layout you see quite often for startups. And for a thousand entrepreneurs, it will be 150 square foot on average multiplies 250 startups. And that will give us 37,500 startups uh, square foot public space. It's about a land of that size, but it doesn't really make, make sense for us how big it is. To give us a better idea, the White House is 50, 55,000 square foot. And that includes both indoor and outdoor. So now, what about the ship? This is one of our favorite candidate ships, Islandscape. It's a ship for 1,500 passengers. We all know that uh, the cruise ship is built for luxury traveling, so we might not want to keep all, its, all of its functions. However, we can also be creative and uh, use some of the existing features and let them contribute to the entrepreneurial community. For example, cruise ships have cafes, and that would be awesome for entrepreneurs because I know a lot of people like to work in places like Starbucks, and cruise ships also have pool. Yeah, I think the pool element is a classic social scene for all the startup houses, like either here in Redwood City or in Mountain View or Mountain View or Palo Alto. So they can be used for the same purpose. And then cruise ships also have theaters that can be easily turned into a conference site for like, for example, TechCrunch Disrupt or the WorkTech conference. I would think we should definitely have this conference on our ship two years from now, right? <laughs> and, but on the other hand, here's another category of things that are fairly typical for cruise ships, but uh, our hardworking hum and humble entrepreneurs don't really need it. The cruise ships have huge dance floors. Uh, that's where a lot of drama happens in the movies, but um, a customer says they don't really need it. But luckily, that's fr uh, that um, dance floor is really huge and it will be awesome for hackathon. Luxury shops, uh, entrepreneurs don't really have the time or money for that, so converting the workspace. <laughs> and uh, casinos, I guess this works for James Bond, the bar, 
our customers kind of more want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, so <laughs> yeah. And then we come, uh, the final result we got is that uh, we, we got at least 49,984 square foot from all those converted public spaces, plus the original cafes and pools and additional restaurants because we have a smaller community than the actual passenger capacity of the ship. So the space problem is not solved. <laughs> then the next question, interesting question to look into is, how do we, given this space, how do we actually maximize the productivity and the creativity in, in this space? Do we use closed office or open office? Let's look at the bubble size of both. The closed office environment kind of isolates you from disruptions, but um, it's also more expensive. And maybe like staying in a room for six hours maybe means that uh, this guy could be doing something else. And for, on the other hand, for open office <coughs> environment, it's fairly typical among services, so it has all the advantages that we're talking about. I'm not going, not going to repeat that, but we do have people complaining that uh, it's really hard for them to concentrate if everybody else around them are either taking calls or talking all the time. So we think a one-size-fits-all office plan does not really accommodate the variations in participation types we have. So we come up with what we call the Floyd office. For example, this is the dance floor we were just talking about that can be turned into a huge workspace. And we're also going to allocate some of the single cabins into op small offices in which anybody can sign up for it if they feel they like it. Of course, it will be shared by everybody else. So here's the productivity issue. And then the next thing, we come to the culture part of the ship, which is really interesting. So TechCrunch has an article about us describing us as the real pirates of Silicon Valley. We all know that uh, uh, th this name came from a movie talking about the stories between Apple and Microsoft in its early days. So it basically gave us an idea of the pirate's mentality. What exactly does pirate mean for startup world? Michael Arlington has this famous article called Are You a Pirate? in which he described all entrepreneurs to be pirates. They don't need a reward for taking risk because they get utility out of risk itself. Steve Jobs also has this famous or infamous pirate flag for his team with which they developed the first Macintosh computer. I think this is exactly what the Blue Seed entrepreneurs wants to be. Surprisingly, when you look at the motivation for moving the Blue Seed, the visa issue is, is, not the top issue, is not the top motivation. The top motivation is living and working awesome startup and technology oriented space. So this will be our goal. And in order to, in order to uh, fully design a place like this, we have done some homework, and here are some research findings that we would like to share with you. So here's, um, this is our top research finding. Yeah, it's a, it's a bathroom sign with Woody the Woodpecker on it. And a lot of people say this is the coolest bathroom sign in the world. This is a bathroom sign in a Pixar headquarters. And what is special about this is that um, one of the many legacies Steve Jobs has for Pixar is that the whole company has only two bathrooms. And they're all located in the center area of the company. This is really inefficient for employees because you guys have to, work, uh, have to walk for 10 minutes just to get to the bathroom. But right now, the Pixar people are, are all talking about all the awesome conversation they had when washing their hands. So what can Brucey learn from this? I'm not saying that we're only going to have two bathrooms for a thousand people on the whole ship, because uh, I guess doing that, the bathroom will just break down at some point. But um, we do have designed this central area for people to mingle and the brainstorm, and uh, maybe a set of bathrooms for each deck. And here's the interesting, uh, you guys must have heard of the magical number of 150 or 50. It basically says that uh, the intercommunication between team decreased dramatically after the team size is bigger than 150. There's lots of business application of this principle. For example, Pat has a, maximize, uh, has a maximum of friends of 150. But this concept actually came, originally came from this theory called the Allen curve, and it is about, it's about distances. It is developed by Thomas Allen, a professor from MIT in the 1970s, he found that um, the intercommunication between coworkers just 
uh, decrease dramatically with the increase of their distances. And if two people are separated more than 50 meters, it's very unlikely that they will have any communication for, give, for any given week. The lesson we learned from this is that uh, our deck will be shorter than 150 meters and our workspace will be shorter than 50 meters. The rest will just be cabins where people live together like a college dorm. And here's an interesting question, another interesting question about uh, being outside of a group actually solve the problem better. We have researched an interesting company called InnoCentric. It has established an open innovation network of uh, 200,000 problem solvers over 170 countries. And so far, $28 million has been awarded to these problem solvers. So the lesson we learned from this is that uh, outsiders are often more, uh, also often more willing to solve a question because they can look at it from a different angle and also bring some of their own resources to it, which is unexperienced by the previous party. But uh, when it comes to blue seed, I think we need to reframe the question a little bit. For Blue City, the question would be among this 1,014 entrepreneurs from 309 startups from 60 countries, who really is an insider? Actually, nobody's an insider. You can very easily borrow either a Ferrari design from Italy or a rascal design from Japan to your product. You don't have to be Steve Jobs or travel to both countries to get inspirations because they will just be right next door to you. So to sum it up, uh, to sum it up, th th this is what we get. This is the lessons we learned for how do we form a thriving innovation environment. I think what we're ultimately trying to achieve is exactly in the same line with the theme of this conference. And we're using this unique approach of putting a shift and putting all these people in proximity to each other to realize this vision, what we're trying to attain is a combination of high-tech university dorm plus 24-7 hackathon. With that, um, really appreciate your time, and thank you, and welcome questions. Thank you, Jai. So we have about five minutes for questions for Jai. You guys are a talkative audience to each other, but not so many questions. Yeah. Uh, yes. When's the launch? The ship will be launched about the third quarter of next year. Yeah, Q3 uh, 2013, and uh, to the latest uh, Q1 2014. So, welcome aboard. And <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about um, what type of reservations or how it's working to? you know, a uh, reserve space. And I'm curious, some entrepreneurs have families that they may not want to leave for a long time. Are there accommodations that, ha you know, for non-working people? Does that make sense? Yes, we don't think of this uh, workspace as a permanent resident site for anybody. First of all, we, um, our program is also an incubator program, so people are not going to stay there for like a whole many years. They may stay there for three months, six months till their company get funded and they can, they can for the EB-5 visa to move into Silicon Valley. And for the former part of the question, uh, most of our entrepreneurs currently are in their 20s and they will be free to go to San Francisco because we will be 12 nautical miles to the shore, which means that uh, it takes about 30 minutes, 30 minutes to get to Hapon Bay, which I think is closer to San, closer to San Francisco. And, uh, we will have daily ferries run back and forth in the early in the afternoon, and people can come to the shore using a business or tourist visa, and then come back to work. So it's not like the real pirates that they're isolated on this, on, on, on the same ship with a thousand other people and can't find anywhere else, anywhere else to go. They're actually free, but uh, this will be the, uh, the best place for them to work at. I have a question for you. Have you yeah. given some thought to how IP protection works among pirates on the open seas? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, our ship, uh, any given ship uh, on international water has to, has to have a flag, and our ship is flagged the flag of Bahamas, which means that we're Bahamas territory. We will have, uh, we will have to uh, comply by the law there, and we also have a number of uh, law firm partners, for, for example, Fenwick, the premier law firm in Silicon Valley is one of our partners. 
and uh, they will be they will love to take care of a lot of the IP issues arise among these companies. 